Welcome to Nourish with Kristen, your weekly chat with certified nutrition therapist and lifelong foodie, Kristen Whitaker, coming to you from Utah Natural Wellness with a reminder that your food should serve you. So let's dish. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in here, Utah Natural Wellness. I'm Kristen Whitaker, certified nutrition therapist and food enthusiast, and I'm excited to talk all things food. Uh, Today, our topic, we're talking eight weight loss myths, things I wish I would have known so many years ago and things that I would hope you might know already. Let's talk about these eight things that might be holding you back and let's get past them. Let's just toss them out all together and move on. Weight loss myth number one, thin equals healthy. We, as a society, we just idolize thinness and slenderness, right? And we, we covet that, we want that. Um, I've often like joked about, you know, women walk by and like, oh, I want that body, meaning I wanna try it on and take it home and wear it instead of the one I've got, right? Like, like a body is a pair of jeans and we can just swap with people, right? Um, so a lot of us equate thin as being healthy, but the fact is you can be just as sick or even more sick as a, a thin person as somebody who's carrying extra weight. Or we could be looking at somebody with what we think has the perfect body, maybe even a fitness guru, and we could just be wishing we looked like them, unaware that they go home every day in battle um, with illnesses and pains and problems that we wouldn't wish on our greatest enemies, if that makes sense. So we can't judge someone just by looking and thin does not equal healthy. In fact, a lot of thin people still have markers for what's called metabolic syndrome. And this can be things like really high blood pressure, um, sky high cholesterol, um, hormonal imbalances, things that are markers for cardiovascular disease like heart attack and stroke later on. And this is why you'll see thin people that just drop from a heart attack or a stroke and it seems out of the blue because no one saw it coming because they were thin and we think they must be healthy. So and of course you can be thin and be toxic, you can be thin and malnourished, you can be thin and hormonally imbalanced, you can be thin and just plain sick. So I, I'm trying to dispel the myth that um, if you attain thinness, if you, if you worked really hard and got this perfectly thin slender body that you were happy with, that doesn't mean you arrived at health and people can do some very unhealthy things to become thin. So let's just dispel that myth that thin equals healthy and let's focus instead on being healthy. Like my ideal client, the people I work with, aren't so much worried about being skinny as they are feeling good. They, they get out of their head um, looking good and they choose instead to function well. They just want to be good inside and out. So let's dispel shallow assumptions. Thin equals healthy, fat equals sick. We're not gonna go there, we're going for something deeper. So that's the first myth. The second myth, and this one can get, you might say on the surface you agree with me, but it might be deeply entrenched in your thought processes and it might be showing up in ways you don't even know. The myth is that a calorie equals a calorie. One equals one. And it doesn't matter what you're putting in your mouth, it's the calorie count that determines whether you're going to lose or gain weight. There's so many systems out there for sale that say if you just count your calories, we guarantee you'll lose weight. And it's not that simple. I mean, I wish it was, but it's not. There's too many variables. So technically, one pound of fat is 3,500 calories, right? So if we do the math, if we cut down our daily food by 500 calories a day, then logistically, realistically, within a week, we should be dropping a pound. We could drop a pound a week just by cutting 500 calories a day. Does it, anyone have experience with that working? I've, I've cut calories drastically below that and haven't budged on the scale. Um, it's not a guarantee the math doesn't add up because there's too many variables in our food. Our body doesn't process carbohydrates the same way it does proteins, the same way it does fats. Um, and you throw chemicals in the mix and it might not even know what to do with it and it might store it as fat thinking it's protecting you. Uh, the, the fact is um, food affects our hormones, it affects enzymes and digestion, it affects so many things inside of our body that it matters more what we eat than it does how much we eat. Certainly we have to watch portions and things if we're trying to lose weight 
but but I want you to focus more on food quality than quantity because when it comes down to it, your genes understand the language of whole foods. It doesn't always know what to do with chemical, you know, crap storms, okay? Uh, if we're giving it food that will balance um, problems it's having, it will reward you by getting rid of extra weight as part of that balance, okay? But if we're putting in chemicals, if you're like, I can only eat this many calories a day, I choose to just eat pizza and Coke, and but only this much and then I'm done, you're not going to thrive as if you ate 10 times more food, but it was healthy whole foods. So let's ditch that calorie equals a calorie and let's get a little more complex in our understanding of food. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, this one's brutal and if you've experienced this, chime in and let me know. I can starve myself skinny. This is the willpower myth and I have had so many friends and loved ones and myself on this trap, in this train, that um, we deprive ourselves. I just won't eat that. And the, you know, there's that saying, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And I will just not eat that and I will be fine. And um, a step further is I won't eat anything and I will lose weight. So we think we can will ourselves to eat less and, and we'll be rewarded with weight loss, with this perfect body. And that's so dangerous and it's so wrong and it sets us up not only for failure but it sets us up for shame and blame and a vicious cycle that just perpetuates more toxic behaviors. So eating less and even exercising more, you're like, I'm burning off everything. I only ate 500 calories today and I burned off a thousand and you can uh, go on at this punishing rate, but it doesn't necessarily equal weight loss because you cannot out will biology. Willpower will never trump biology. And it, it fails to take into account things like um, hormones or food choices and types. Um, and even more so, it, it activates countermeasures from our body. So we're trying to starve ourselves skinny. We're trying to deprive ourselves. Um, what's going to happen is our, our brain's going to say, you know what? I'm going to take over the controls because you don't know what you're doing and you're heading us right into a famine, into starvation. And it's going to put a lockdown on our fat loss. It's going to take every bite we do eat and put it directly into fat storage. And the fat stores we have, it's going to put a lock on and it won't let go of it for anything because it's afraid that you're trying to starve it, right? It's going into survival mode. And not only that, but all this extra exercise or whatever we're doing is going to boost our cortisol levels, our stress hormones. It's gonna put us in a fight and flight mode. And so now not only um, can we not lose weight, but we have this hormonal imbalance that basically assures we're going to gain weight. So, I mean, how does that sound? Does that sound like something you can outsmart? Can you outlast that? And in the meantime, your body's pounding you with hunger signals to the point that food you would never eat before looks so good you have to have it now and you're gonna cave and you're gonna gorge and it's gonna be this vicious cycle. You cannot starve yourself skinny. You cannot willpower yourself. You cannot power yourself through an unhealthy habit or a diet you designed if it's not biologically sound. If it doesn't honor your body, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna, it's, you're gonna fail. So, so don't do it. So that makes me think of all the, the holidays and activities I missed out on because I'm, nope, I'm not doing that. And I should have had a healthier attitude. I, I shouldn't have, because this, this myth is probably the most um, responsible for the most damage because um, we're virtuous and we eat good and we try so hard and then we fail. Our biology leads us to binge and then we punish ourselves and then we eat more and it just starts these cycles that that don't serve us and they cause so much emotional damage and carnage. So let's get rid of that one. Um, you cannot will yourself to lose weight um, by fighting your body. Okay, number four, fat makes you fat. We've talked about this a lot and maybe I don't even need to bring it up again, but let's just emphasize that fat does not make you fat. You need fat, you need healthy fat. So your body needs it to function. Your brain um, is comprised mostly of fat. Fat is anti-inflammatory. We make hormones from fat. Um, it signals uh, fat burning genes. So eating fat can help us burn more fat. It increases insulin sensitivity, which you know fights off diabetes. 
Um, it builds protective membranes around every nerve in our body. Uh, if you think you don't need that. Um, and it's essential uh, for utilizing vitamins and minerals that we take into our body. We just, we, we simply need fat. It's uh, an essential um, nutrient. So the difference between, you know, when, when they push the, the lipid heart hypothesis at us and said that eating fat gives us heart attacks and kills us, and suddenly everything on the shelves was fat free, um, they, those studies that they cite failed to take into account healthy fats versus harmful fats. In fact, they pushed a lot of harmful fats. So a quick review, and I will have more details on the blog post recapping this, but healthy fats would be um, grass-fed and pastured animal fats, so clean animal fats like um, grass-fed butter and ghee, uh, grass-fed tallow, pastured lard, also avocado oil, um, ethically sourced coconut oil and palm oil, um, olive oils, pure olive oils, and then look at foods like wild caught fish and, and pastured eggs and nuts and seeds, um, full fat grass fed dairy. These are healthy fats that will serve your body and inevitably help you burn more fat and reach your weight goals, okay? The fats that don't serve us, that will actually make us fat, fats that will make us fat or at least inflamed, right? Those are processed industrial seed oils like canola oil and soybean oil and sunflower oil. Um, it's fake processed fats like margarine um, and shortenings and trans fats and, and even conventional animal fats can be harmful. So um, just know which fats. I did a Facebook Live, oh, I think it was in October. I'll post the link in the show notes too about what healthy fats are and how to use them and how to avoid unhealthy fats. So we've covered that and I'll link that. But fat does not make you fat. The type of fat you use matters. Okay, so number five, um, my weight, my frame, my fat, it's all in my genes. Uh, my, my genes is my destiny. So, you know, everyone in my family looks like this. Everyone in my family eats like this. Everyone in my family dies of this. Uh, a lot of us are just resigned to, to this myth that think that this is how it is. Um, and it's true, our genes do determine a lot of, you know, of how we carry our fat, um, our propensity to um, burn fat easily or to hang on to it how high or low our metabolism is, um, even how much we eat, like our, our appetite, can be um, influenced by our genes. But what a, a lot of people don't know is um, that genes aren't written in stone. They're more like, it's more like a switchboard and some of them, they're not all expressed all the time. They go on and off and certain things can flip them on and flip them off. And this is the study called epigenetics. And it's a really exciting field. And it, um, epigenetics, determines which genes are expressed at which time. So epigenetics includes things like our environment, our actions, even our thoughts. Did you know that even like um, our thoughts can influence how enzymes attach to a protein that determine a gene that's flipped on or off? That's how powerful just even our thoughts are. So we have more control over our genes than most people realize. And so it becomes a powerful tool if we learn to use this in our favor. So, and realize that it could more be your family culture. The, um, the way that you, you eat and feed yourself. We all have this family food culture, right? Or um, are you a sporty family that runs a lot and competes? Or are you more kind of a couch potato laid back kind of family? Uh, it can be learned behaviors and habits, these could be more affecting you. So when you say this is in my genes and my family, it can be more of these learned behaviors than it is actual genetics. It's these things that are flipping our gene expressions on. So more specifically, nutrigenomics, and I love that word, is an exciting new field that studies specifically how food, how nutrition turns genes on and off, especially where disease and obesity are concerned. So again, remember we said this, whole food speaks the language of our genes. Our, our body knows what to do with it. And whole foods, learning which of these serve you and can balance imbalances and heal illness and calm inflammation, learning how to use this is powerful. So a quick example of this would be my husband, who I know, I'm sure he loves when I talk about him in these things. So 
music in the I don't think he ever watches them. But my husband, we had a, a complete cholesterol panel done on him, and he tested, he has this genetic marker that's kind of a tragic marker that um, stacks the deck against him. Like, he's genetically predisposed to have sky-high um, LDL, lou the lousy cholesterol, the bad ones. People with this certain marker are more likely to die of cardiovascular disease, experience blockages, and have just really clinically high LDL cholesterol. And that was so sad to me. I'm like, oh, because, you know, none of us want to have those risk factors. And this was kind of a significant one. But he's on a specific therapeutic diet. We are working to heal specific health challenges he has with food. And we're very careful with what he eats. And he has a carefully designed diet. And if you looked at it, you might go, oh my gosh, he's a recipe for disaster. He's eating so much fat in his diet, right? But... We're eating healthy fats and things designed to serve his body. So when we get his cholesterol test, test back every year, I'm so excited that they're perfect. Textbook perfect. He has beautiful cholesterol numbers. Even with the deck stacked against him genetically, he has beautiful healthy cholesterol numbers. So I mean, what a turn on, right? And so um, it's just a testament to me of the power that our behavior has and our choices have. So we're not we're not victims of our genes. We have more control than we think. So that's cool. Um, speaking of control, the next, the next myth is the protector myth. This is the myth that somebody is looking out for you. And uh, why that can sound comforting at first, it's actually anytime we surrender our control and take somebody else's word for it, we're at risk. And here I'm specifically talking about if you're relying on government recommendations or somebody selling you something or corporate claims or advertising and this is where you're getting your nutrition knowledge you you might not be getting the information that's going to serve your unique biology and you might be getting information that's outright harmful so the fact is that government policy is largely funded by corporate interests sad but true and there's a long history of this and a very damaging history of this and medical professionals, their education is largely funded by pharmaceutical companies. And a lot of doctors will admit this, that they were surprised to find how much of their education is how to use different drugs. Um, and studies are biased. They're almost always biased by who's funding them. And the fact is, with these studies that we hear and they're thrown out in the news all the time, they're funded by somebody. There's not a lot of pure food research that's funded by a benevolent um, fund with no interest, okay? So you always have to look at the information that's being presented by who and who paid for it and who's framing it. So, um, and then public opinion is swayed by corporate dollars, by advertising and marketing. And if you think that you're immune to that, think again. So take the story of fat that we're talking about earlier. So lard used to be the gold standard for healthy fat. That's what great grandma used. It's what everybody prized. It was the best part of the pig. And then when they came out with margarine, people were just grossed out by the thought of this fake food, okay? Well then, enter this corporate smear campaign and, an, and a launch to re-educate people. And suddenly, have you ever gone lard? Ew, gross. And bought that big tub of country crock, which is beautiful and so much healthier. Um, they completely shifted public opinion. And now, luckily, it's starting to shift back. But it's really dramatic that if you take the same golden tub of fake plant oil butter and showed your great-grandma, she would have gone, ew, gross, what is that? So, um, yeah, this is the protector myth. Ultimately, you're the one who's going to need to do the research and turn your thinking cap on and look at facts and say, does that make sense? No, wait a minute, why are eggs bad when they were good yesterday, but they were bad the day before that? Okay, if it's confusing, then you don't have all the facts. So don't rely on anybody else to tell you what's right, especially facts that change all the time. Don't just narrowly accept um, government guidelines as the end all, the truth. The FDA doesn't have time to check out every herb for, and tell you if it's good for you, right? You need to take responsibility and step up your game a little bit. So that's the protector myth. Um, number seven. So uh, number seven is that we lose weight 
by the numbers, live and die by the numbers. And wh what does that mean? We get so attached to numbers. A lot of us, um, when I'm talking to a client for the first time, they'll tell me that magic number that they want to hit. I want to be this. I weighed this when I was 21, I wanna be that again. My roommate weighed this and she was beautiful. That's the number that I want. That's their dream number. And they're married to this number and that's how they're defining health and success and that's what they're stuck on, okay? Or maybe the number is how much they're gonna lose a week. I'm gonna lose three pounds a week. I'm gonna lose five pounds a week, whatever it is. And if they're not losing those numbers, they're not successful and it's not working. Um, maybe they're stepping on the scale five times a day. Have you done that? You step on the scale first thing in the morning and then you go to the bathroom and step on the scale again and then you have breakfast and step on the scale again and then you go out for a run and step on the scale again. There's people that do this, okay? Because they're so attached to the numbers and they're so desperate for validation that's gonna come through numbers. The fact is weight loss isn't a linear process. The way our body releases weight, sometimes we can gain weight while we're reallocating and reshaping and then we'll lose a bunch at once and sometimes we just lose a little bit at a time but it's very steady um, and sometimes we plateau and don't lose weight for a long time but our body's healing and reallocating and there's still healthy things going below the surface but if you're attached to the numbers and you don't see what you think should be happening you might it might be your cue to abandon a path that's leading you to health and wellness okay i have a lot of people that will ditch a healthy path because they're like oh scale hasn't budged in two weeks or I'm just not getting the results I want fast enough and um, and they don't see the numbers they want and that equates with failure and and it's not the truth at all that's not reality at all they need to stop and think well but do you feel better do you sleep better uh, do you have more energy are your pants a little looser there's so many other measures for success than just that number and then the fact is the number that they settled on in their head might not even work for them and I feel so bad to see women, I mean men too, but my experience is mostly with women beating themselves up to reach a number that's never going to serve them. I know I grew up with a twin sister <clears throat> and every once in a while she'd be like, oh, I weigh this and I would feel bad inside because I weighed more than that and I would try to get my weight down so I could compete with her. Guess what? I'm six inches taller than her. That didn't make any sense. But I spent, it's in my, my teenage diary. Oh, I just can't get down to the same weight that Karen's at. So how fair was that? Or, you know, some people have a bigger frame or they carry more musculature and muscle is heavier. I uh, have another sister. I can work out every day and bench press every day and I'm going to get no muscle definition. I'm going to have spaghetti arms till I die. But I have a sister who can pick up a number 10 can of peas and boom, she's Popeye. Her biceps pop out. She just gains muscle and definition easily. But on the other hand, that means her numbers are different than mine. So you just can't pick a number and stick to it. So be a little more open-minded, be a little more flexible. And for your own mental health, you might have to throw that scale away at the beginning of your journey. Because if you find yourself obsessing about that number, it's not serving you. Just get rid of it, okay? So ditch the numbers. That's number seven. And number eight, the last one I want to talk about today is body acceptance. Okay, and I'm going to be careful to articulate what I mean here. Why would I put body acceptance as a myth? Um, so let me start by saying I am completely anti-body shaming. Okay, but I'm not for body acceptance necessarily either. So um, I've seen people that are very unhealthy and um, they declare, but I accept my body. This is my body. This is how it is. There's a difference between body acceptance and body compassion and body appreciation. You don't have to settle for what you have going on right now. Okay. So when I say body acceptance, that sounds to me like people who are resigned to their fate. This is what I weigh. This is how I feel. This is how I function. These are my limits and I just have to accept that. That's how my body is. See, I have this belief that we can improve and we can build and we can expand our capacities every day with our choices and our habits, okay? So if I accept that this is as good as I'm going to get, then I've halted my progress. And so I, I have so much admiration for athletes that push the envelope and constantly look to break their own records and have their 
their goals and their sights set way out here, meaning they're always achieving and pushing. You can do that to an extreme where it's harmful, but if I'm saying if you're in line with your body and your biology, go for it. If you want to get out of bed without aches and pains, do it. If you want to um, be able to run a marathon and it, you're nowhere near it right now, who says you can't do that? Start doing that. You know, If you are tired of carrying 100 pounds of extra weight and it just hurts and it's holding you back, let's get rid of that. You don't have to accept that. That's what I mean when I say body acceptance is a myth. You don't have to accept that. But like I said, we're going to proceed with body compassion, with body um, appreciation. So remember I mentioned when we were talking about epigenetics that even our thoughts can change how our cells function to create physical health or the opposite, okay? We need to start every day with positive body messages because guess what? This is what we have to work with. For good or bad, this is what we have, okay? This is the transportation for our journey. This is the tabernacle we live in. This is our clay. This is our greatest ally. So we need to infuse that with power and confidence. We'd, we need to not work with um, punishment and shame, okay? I've been on diets where I went to reach for a, a treat that I wanted and instead I would pinch a fat roll and I'd be like, ooh, that's disgusting. I don't deserve that. I can't have that. And I would use punitive measures like that to try to trick myself into staying on a diet. And that's horrible. What a horrible thing to do. We need to adopt habits that honor our body, that infuse us with positivity, that make us want to achieve our goals and not punish ourselves for being less than what we think we should be. So um, our body is an ally. It's not an enemy to be subdued or battled. It's not us against our bodies. We need to work with our bodies. And this includes learning to listen to them. So um, we need to understand the messages it's giving us. If we have an imbalance or something that's not working right, that's our body saying, I need this, I need less of this, I need more of this. It's crying out for something. We need to learn to hear what that is so we can give our body what it needs. This is why when we charge down a road saying you need to weigh less and I'm going to tell you how and we don't care if our body says it's hungry and we don't care if our body says it's tired, we're going to push it to this goal, we're, we're not doing anybody any favors. Not our body, not our mental health, not our ultimate success. We're, we're setting up to fail. We have to work with our bodies. So in that sense, maybe that's where we're accepting our body, that we have to do this with our body. You don't have to accept less than health. You don't have to accept inflammation and pain and extra weight and limitations. You don't have to accept that. You can change that, but you have to do it with grace and gratitude. One uh, powerful way to do this is in the morning when you're getting ready, inevitably you've got to look yourself in the face, right? Like none of us wake up like this. And if you do, tell, tell me your secrets, okay? But that mirror time we have one-on-one -on -one with ourselves, that's a great time to say thank you. Thank you for that sleep I had last night. That was wonderful. Um, you look beautiful today. Or I really love how your eyes are sparkling. Or just start talking and saying these things to yourself and get yourself going on a positive note. Don't you think your body is going to be more willing to work with you if you're kind to it? it? It makes sense, right? And it also resonates on a biological level. There's principles and studies that prove this too. So thank your body for embarking on this journey of healing with you. And thank it for having the capacity to change. And take your body with you rather than fighting it and punishing it and, and um, being disgusted with yourself or shaming it. Those things have no place in a healing journey. So those are the eight myths that I have for you today. So one, thin equals healthy. That's not necessarily true. Two, a calorie does not always equal a calorie. It's more about quality than quantity, okay? Three, you can starve yourself skinny or will yourself through it. False. You cannot willpower your way past biology. You just can't. Um, four, fat makes you fat. Not true if it's the good kind. Um, five, your genes are your destiny. This is what your family looks like. This is how it is. That's not true either. You have more power than that. Six is the protector myth. There's somebody else, a big brother looking out for you. No. You're looking out for yourself. You have the power. Seven, live and die by the numbers. No, you've got to be flexible. You have to be accepting of the journey. And you have to 
look for other measurements and markers to judge your health by than just an arbitrary number. And finally, body acceptance. You don't have to accept less than health. You can be healthy. Um, and you do this with compassion and love. So um, feel free to type in the chat any of the myths that you've encountered and ways that you've, you've overcome those. And look for the replay because I'll have links to um, other chats like healthy fats, for example, and other things that will serve you. And that will be up on my website, nourishwithkristen.com, in the next couple days. Um, in the meantime, if you need help, like constructing a plan to help you get from where you are now to where you want to be, a plan to help you feel better and be healthier, give me a call and let me know. I have a free 20 minute consultation available on my website that you can book. Um, and we can talk about what I'm able to help you with. And remember, it's all about improving a little bit every day. It's all about getting better a little bit at a time. So let's figure out how you can do that together. And thanks for your time. I hope you have a great day and I will talk to you in our next chat. I'm going to continue this weight loss journey. We're going to talk about hormones. It's a crazy game and how, um, how many play and influence our weight and how to balance them so that they're all working for you rather than against you. So tune in for that. And in the meantime, shoot me any questions you want. We'll see you later.